Our present knowledge of the nature of matter and forces can be summarized uh, on one page. We've known since the late 19th century that uh, matter is made of atoms, and we've known since 1911 that atoms consist of a very small uh, nucleus carrying positive electric charge, surrounded by a swarm of electrons with negative electric charge. Since the 30s, we've known that the nucleus uh, is made of protons and neutrons, and in the last uh, 30 years, we've learned that protons and neutrons are made of particles called quarks. The electron is uh, a member of a set of six particles, which are called by a jargon word, leptons. These are particles that do not feel the <coughs> nuclear force. If the electron felt the nuclear force, it would be captured into the nucleus, but it does not. Accompanying uh, the electrically charged electron, there is a neutral particle, the nu electron neutrino, nu sub e, which is sort of a twin, except it's not electrically charged to the electron, but it's very much lighter, perhaps even massless. There are th some other leptons here, two with electrical charges called the mu and the tau, each of which also have accompanying neutrinos. The mu and the tau particles, as far as we can tell, have identical properties to those of the electron, except for the fact that the mu is 200 times heavier than the electron, and the tau is 3,500 uh, three times heavier. Uh, why they exist and what their role is in the scheme of things is a mystery. There are six types of quarks known. And by taking the different types of quarks and putting them together in different combinations, vibrating and rotating in the different ways allowed by quantum mechanics, one can make whole families of particles known as hadrons, a jargon word for the particles that do feel the nuclear force. The six leptons and the six quarks seem to be rather simple. Down to the smallest level we can study them, seem to be structureless. It's possible even that they're elementary. Turning to the forces that control the behavior of these constituents of matter, gravity is, of course, the most familiar. Then there's the electric force, the magnetic force, the weak force, which is responsible for radioactive beta decay and also vital in the way that the sun burns. And finally, the strong force or interquark force, which holds the quarks together in the protons and neutrons. Since the work of Faraday and others, perfected by Maxwell, we've known that electric and magnetic phenomena are different manifestations of a single electromagnetic force. And in the last 20 years, we've learned, largely from experiments at CERN, that in fact weak phenomena are closely related to electric and magnetic phenomena, and all three are different manifestations of a single electroweak force. Well, there are two questions you may ask confronted with this. So what? Does it help us cure unemployment? Does it help us uh, understand biology or build better semiconductor devices? And you may ask, is this progress? Well, I think you'd concede that our understanding of the forces represents progress. But for the constituents, could it be that all we're doing is just peeling back more and more layers of an infinitely deep onion? Let me look first at the question, uh, so what? It seems, with a question mark to which I will return, that we do uh, not need a knowledge of the deep structure of matter and forces to understand the behavior of matter on larger scales. Let's consider the behavior of water on scales large compared to that of atoms. Given the density and the viscosity of water, we can get an excellent description without any knowledge of atoms whatsoever, let alone of quarks and leptons. If you want to know why the density and the viscosity of water take the values that they take, then you have to turn to the molecular and atomic structure. But there you can get an excellent description if you're given the mass of the nuclei and the electric charges without knowing anything about nuclear physics. So it seems that we can understand nature one layer at a time, the dependence on the physics at deeper scales being buried, hidden, in a few parameters, the density and viscosity of water, in the example that I took. This decoupling of science on different scales is actually, I think, perhaps even necessary for science to be possible. Imagine that the properties of water depended directly on those of quarks and leptons. Then you couldn't understand anything without understanding everything, and we'd probably be stuck. This decoupling of scales is so familiar that we tend to take it for granted, but it's actually not at all obvious, although mathematical physicists now think that they understand that it must be so.
So uh, we do not need to know the deep structure of matter and understand it to understand biology. On the other hand, if the deep structure of, of the matter and the quarks and leptons were different, then biology would be different. So in that sense, it's true that the deep structure does determine the structure of larger scales. It's even possible in principle, again with a question mark to which I will return, that the deep structure of matter and forces determines the structure of everything, including the structure of the whole universe. It's also possible that there may be laws that you do not see at small scales, which only come into play when there are many part different particles involved on very large scales, but there's no evidence for that such forces. In any case, uh, even if it does not determine it completely, the deep structure of matter and forces does determine the structure of matter on a larger scale, and therefore studying matter and forces is a major part uh, of natural philosophy. Now, let me turn to the question of whether it's progress. As I said, I think our understanding of the forces is, is progress. I think for the constituents also, because the quarks are simpler, in fact, than the protons and neutrons. But more importantly, there's been major progress in understanding principles and ideas where nature seems to exhibit an elegant economy. And I want, in the next uh, minutes, to run over some of the ideas and principles which we've uncovered in the last 30 or more years, which could lie behind a deeper synthesis in our understanding of nature. Let me start with quantum mechanics and relativity, the two cornerstones of 20th century physics. It's remarkable that in theories which combine quantum mechanics and relativity, and any theory that's right must combine them, in such theories, forces have to be due to exchange of particles, which means that force is not a separate concept. Given particles, and given that particles can interact, force must follow. This is illustrated here with an analogy of two skaters sliding towards each other on a frozen lake who exchange a ball. And the recoil, when she throws the ball, drives her apart from this chap who is driven sideways when he catches it. So the exchange of the ball generates a sort of repulsive interaction between them. This is actually a very poor analogy, uh, not least because we can have attractive as well as repulsive forces. But there is one thing in this analogy which is correct, which is that the effect of forces depend on two things. First, the strength of the players in this analogy is simply the muscle power, how hard they interact with the particle they exchange, how hard they can throw it. And secondly, the effect of the force depends very much on the range, which in turn depends on the mass of the particle they exchange. If it's very heavy, they can only interact if they're close together. If it's very light, they can interact at longer distances. So forces depend on two things, the strength of the players, the interaction, and the mass of the particle that's exchanged. Here's a more professional picture of this process. We see here an electron and a proton uh, interacting by exchanging a particle of light, a quantum of light, a photon. We know that the light that's reaching you from this screen is composed of small particles called photons. And here, the effect here depends on the electric charge, the strength with which the photon couples electrically, and also the range of the force, which in this case is infinitely long because the photon is massless. Uh, here are the names of the carriers of the photon, of the forces, the photon, which I'll call gamma from now on, the W and the Z that carry the weak force, those are the particles that are exchanged in an analogous way in weak interactions, the gluon and the strong force, and the graviton. Well, you may ask, if forces are due to the exchange of particles, why did I talk separately about constituents and forces? After all, constituents are particles. If forces are due to the exchange of particles, why didn't I just talk about particles? Why this separation into constituents and forces? And the reason is that the constituents and the force-carrying particles have rather different properties. The constituents have half-integral quantum mechanical spin, a concept I'm not going to try to explain, whereas the force carriers have integral quantum mechanical spin. So to have a true unification of constituents and force carriers, one would like to have a principle that related these sort of particles, the force carriers, with the constituent particles. Uh, it turns out that such a principle is known mathematically. It's called supersymmetry. But we don't know if it's there in nature. So that's a very interesting question. Can, is there in nature a supersymmetry waiting to be discovered, which would allow us a truly unified description of forces and particles? <coughs> 
Incidentally, the particles to which Cho Sook referred, which might be the candidates for the dark matter, could be supersymmetric particles. Let me turn now to uh, an even uh, harder idea. This is the hard part of the talk. The idea of a local symmetry, or in the jargon, a gauge symmetry. Uh, so what's the idea of a gauge symmetry? What's the point of it? Well, it turns out, let me jump to the result, if one has a theory which has what's called a local symmetry, then in such theory there must be certain sorts of interactions. They're required to exist, so it's a principle which determines the forms of the interactions. The existence of a symmetry is uh, synonymous uh, with the existence of an operation which leaves an object looking the same. For example, continue the, uh, consider this star here. If you rotate it through 45 degrees, it looks the same. So there's a symmetry under rotation through 45 degrees. Consider this circle. It looks the same whatever angle you rotate it through. So it's uh, symmetrical under any rotation. Actually, in the following, I'm going to be concerned mainly not with rotations in space, but with rotations in internal spaces, internal labels or coordinates which particles carry. Now, uh, when there is a symmetry and there are certain labels, it means that there's a convention and the choice of that convention is arbitrary. For example, in this case here, if I want to label the corners, one, two, three, four, etc., where I start the labeling is arbitrary. In this circle, if I want to label the points on the circle by an angle, I've got to choose a direction, arbitrarily, relative to which I measure the angles. So when there's a symmetry, there is some arbitrary convention. And we say that the laws of nature have a symmetry when they're independent of the choice of some convention. So that, for example, we believe that nature is rotationally symmetric. The laws of nature look the same if you describe the positions in terms of three axes, x, y, and z. The description doesn't matter whether you point the axes like this, or like this, or like that. The question then arises, could you have a local symmetry? Would it be possible to choose different labels and conventions at different times, or different places and different times? In the case of a discrete symmetry like this, I think the answer is no, because if I choose to label 1, 2, 3, 4 here, but over here I choose the labels differently, somewhere in between there must be an abrupt change, and the laws of nature could not look the same at that point. On the other hand, you can imagine that with the choice of axes, if I choose my x, y, and z like this over here, if I choose them slightly differently here and slightly differently here and continuously vary the direction of my axes, maybe I could write the laws of nature so they look the same even if uh, we in the UK, as we're wont to do, choose different conventions than the rest of the world, provided the conventions vary smoothly. The answer is yes, you can write the laws of nature with certain conditions in a way that you can choose conventions locally, which is a rather beautiful idea, but only if there exist in such theories certain forces, force fields with special features, apparently, apparently long range, corresponding to the existence of force carriers, apparently massless, with special interactions. So generally, most theories with a symmetry, you cannot choose the conventions separately at different places, but if you're prepared to introduce these special forces, then you can. Why are they there? They're there to reconcile moving particles to different conventions. Supposing I do choose my axes differently at different places. Here I have a particle that starts to move, and I want it to see exactly the same laws of physics. How's it going to know that the convention's changing? It can only know if there is some, long, some influence, some force field around it, which tells it, look, the laws are changing, change the, laws, uh, change the rules to look the same. So uh, this is a possibility. It doesn't have to be like that. But very remarkably, gravity is like that, the electroweak force is like that, and the strong force. Quite remarkably, the three known forces all make use of this uh, poss mathematical possibility, which is a very powerful one because it requires the existence of forces, of interactions, with very specific features. The last idea that I want to discuss is the idea that some of the, uh, some of the uh, laws of nature could be hidden, the idea of hidden symmetries. Uh, what is this idea? 
It's the idea that the phenomena that we see in nature need not exhibit the symmetries of the underlying laws. Uh, that's a rather powerful idea because it means that, I mean, generally speaking, when you have a symmetry, everything looks very perfect and it's rather boring. But nature has a rich complexity. Uh, if we have a hidden symmetry, we can have simple laws, but somehow when we solve the relevant equations, the solution is asymmetrical. If you make a literature search, the earliest example of this seems to be Buridan's ass in the 14th century. And Buridan, you may remember, imagined what would happen to a donkey uh, with poised exactly symmetrically between two bunches of carrots. And he came to the conclusion that uh, in these exactly balanced influences, he'd be unable to make up his mind which way to go and would die of starvation. <laughs> of course, presumably this would be an example of a hidden symmetry. The donkey would arbitrarily decide to go one way or another, therefore hiding the underlying symmetry. Here's a slightly more mathematical example of a ball sitting symmetrically poised in a valley like this. It's a position with perfect symmetry about the center, but it's unstable. Presumably, uh, arbitrarily, it will fall one way or the other, and the symmetry will be hidden. And the idea of the hidden symmetry is that somehow the description of the entire universe uh, could be like this. The underlying laws could be symmetrical, symmetrical, but the solutions could be lopsided, so we don't see the symmetry. Uh, this must be the case in the case of the electroweak symmetry. The data, especially the data from taken at CERN in the last few years, tell us that the carriers of the weak force, the W and the Z, and the photon, the carrier of the electromagnetic force, have closely related interactions, charges, the strengths with which they're coupled, and the data tell us that they seem to be these gauge particles associated with a local symmetry. But on the face of it, when you have a local symmetry, the force carrying particles should be massless. The mass of the photon should be zero. It is zero. But the mass of the W and Z are not zero. So the data are telling us the symmetry is there, but it's not showing up in the masses of these particles. And it's the fact that these are so heavy which makes the weak force weak and makes the manifestation of the forces so different. By the way, there's another thing which must be different because these particles are heavy. We know that uh, the light can be polarized in two directions, as you've learned when doing polarization experiments. Uh, but these heavy particles must be polarized three ways because we can bring them to rest. Imagine a particle of light which can be polarized in two directions. But if we could bring it to rest, it makes no sense to say it can be polarized only this way and this way. It'd have to be polarized that way as well. So these heavy particles, the gauge symmetry seems to be hidden in that these particles are heavy, whereas this one's massless. And these seem to have an extra degree of freedom. They can be polarized a third way. It turns out that to provoke an asymmetrical solution, one needs an extra ingredient, which you also need to provide this third degree of freedom. We know from the data that these are gauge particles. We therefore know that there must be an extra ingredient in the theory, but we don't know what it is. It appears that there must be at least one additional physical particle associated with these extra ingredients, the so-called Higgs boson. But we don't know if that is right. So it's a very interesting situation. The data tell us there's a symmetry. The symmetry is hidden. There must be an ingredient which allows the laws of nature to find this asymmetrical solution. We don't know what it is. We have some models, but we need to test them experimentally. Let me discuss briefly another possible example of a hidden symmetry, which we don't know if it's correct or not. It's the idea of a symmetry between the electroweak and the strong forces. It's a, the idea is that fundamentally, although they look very different, the strong and the electroweak forces could be the same. That idea has a very remarkable implication because it tells us that actually quarks and leptons must be the same. Why is that? Well, what's the difference between a quark and a lepton? Both feel the electroweak quark force. The difference is that the quarks feel the strong force and the leptons don't. But if we make a theory in which the strong force is fundamentally no different than the electroweak, then there can't be any difference between the quarks and leptons. So it's a very powerful idea, which may or may not be correct, which is that the electroweak and the strong forces could be united, which has a wonderful corollary that at the same time, the two different sorts of, of, of constituents, the quarks and the leptons, must be united. <laughs>
If they're united, by the way, then there must be couplings between the quarks and the leptons and a new sort of particle called an X particle. And a transition like this would allow the proton to decay. That's pretty important, if true, cosmologically especially in the other direction, starting in the early universe, an interaction like that could uh, provide the creation of protons in the first place. So this is a very interesting possibility. If it's correct, however, this symmetry must be very, very deeply hidden because we don't see the proton decay. In fact, we know experimentally that protons live for at least 10 to the 33 years. <laughs> Therefore, this effect, the effects of this force must be extremely feeble if it's there at all which means it must be the only way that can be is if it's very, very short range, meaning this X particle is extremely heavy. And a very heavy X particle could also screen from us the underlying equality of these forces and account for the fact that the observed strength of the electromagnetic charge, Q electromagnetic, I've called it, and the strong force look very different. But this is simply a, a hypothesis. We don't know if that's correct. So these are some of the principles that underlie uh, the progress we've made in the last years. Are there any missing principles? Are there any big gaps, lacunae, in our understanding? Let me point to two. First, I believe that we do not understand quantum mechanics, and I believe myself personally, though not everyone shares this view, that there is a new principle there, which is simply missing. We don't know what it is. Secondly, we do not have a theory which combines quantum mechanics and gravity Maybe the principles needed to create such a theory exist, and we haven't been clever enough to create it. That's very possible. But it's also possible that we need a new principle. Maybe it's the same principle that underlies quantum mechanics. Maybe it's yet another principle. Armed with those remarks, let me return to these question marks up here. It's possible that the idea, the new principle behind quantum mechanics, involves forces which only come into play when there are many particles together, which you simply don't see on a microscopic scale. In that case, knowledge of the microstructure would not be enough to give us a complete understanding of macroscopic physics. I don't know if that's right. Maybe, maybe not. There are some people who even believe that an understanding of quantum gravity and quantum mechanics plays some role in consciousness. If so, the deep structure of quantum gravity will be needed to understand matter on a larger scale. But these are open questions. Let me leave these rather speculative remarks and return uh, from the principles to our present state of knowledge of the constituents and forces. Uh, this description, which I've already uh, d gone over with you, is called the standard model by particle physicists. It represents tremendous progress, uh, but it's by no means the end. First of all, it's logically incomplete because it doesn't have a quantum theory of gravity. And it's too complex, too baroque even. It's got too many parameters, too many open questions to be a final theory. And I've listed uh, some of the open questions here, and I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, discussing them. First of all, this question, could the neutrinos have small masses? In the simplest version of the standard model, uh, the answer is no. But no principle requires them to be massless. Many of us think they probably do have masses. That's a very important question for astrophysicists, because small neutrino masses could account for the fact that the number of neutrinos we observe reaching us from the sun seems to be less than ought to be there, according to the successful theory of why the sun is shining. It's also an interesting question for cosmologists, because if neutrinos have small masses, they could be a component of the dark matter, which was discussed a few minutes ago. Next, uh, the origin of what's called, in the jargon, CP violation. This is the very small asymmetry we observe in the laboratory between matter and antimatter. Small in the laboratory, but with enormous cosmological implications, because it could be responsible for the fact that the, matter seems to be, the universe seems to be made of matter and not, not antimatter. Is the origin uh, that which is said to be in the standard model, namely due to what's called a small phase in the ma mass matrix? We don't know. We don't have enough evidence. That's an open question. Is it the case that, uh, as predicted by our successful theory of the strong nuclear force, which has the jargon name QCD, by the way, is it the case that if you crush or heat nuclear matter, a new form of matter is formed, a quark-gluon plasma?
The idea being if you crush, let's say, a lead nucleus, uh, at a certain point the protons and neutrons overlap and merge into one soup of quarks and, and the glue particles. Also, if you heat it up, they bang together sufficiently frequently that it will melt. Is that right or not? What are the properties of this plasma? That's very interesting for us particle physicists. It's interesting for astrophysicists because the densities at which this might happen are present in neutron stars. And it's interesting to cosmologists because the relevant temperatures were certainly there in the early universe. What is the origin of this symmetry hiding? Uh, why are there six quarks and six leptons? Is it a coincidence there are six of each? Or is there, as in these grand unified theories that unify the strong and electroweak forces, is there a connection between the quarks and the leptons? What, why, why six? What fixes the number six? Presumably there is some self-consistency in the deeper theories of things which requires the number six. We don't know. What about further unification, which I've discussed? Uh, between the, the electroweak and the strong forces, perhaps also gravity? And what about the idea of connecting the constituent particles with the force-carrying particles in supersymmetry? An idea which mathematically is possible, but we don't know if it's an idea uh, which nature uni uh, uses. Well, what are the prospects uh, for answering these questions? In the last 30 years or so, uh, we've established a framework which is capable of providing a much deeper th synthesis. So the stage is set for tremendous progress. But it's impossible without input from experiment. I should also mention in the last 30 years the tremendous symbiosis between particle physics, astrophysics, and cosmology, which I hope came through in some of the things I was saying in a few minutes ago, and in the, it certainly came through in the previous talk. So the stage is set. The framework is there. The principles are either there. But we don't know if these principles, to what extent they're used. We need experiment. What are the prospects of help from experiment? In the 1990s, there are a range of experiments that will be carried out which could uh, lead uh, to uh, important breakthroughs. But each of these experiments is, to a certain extent, a gamble. Uh, none is certain to make a breakthrough. To be sure of a breakthrough, we need to get to what I call the landmark energy of 1,000 GeV. That's to study the collisions of constituents with kinetic energy 1,000 times the energy contained in the rest mass of a proton. What's magic about that energy? What's magic is that if you take the standard model, but without this Higgs particle, which we don't know about, at that point, the standard model starts to give nonsensical predictions probabilities greater than one and things like that, which can't happen. So if we take the known parts, the tested parts of the standard model, we blindly calculate, there comes an energy where the model gives nonsense. So it must be wrong. Therefore, by studying collisions at this landmark energy, one is guaranteed to find either the Higgs particle or something else, whatever else that missing ingredient is that must hide the symmetry. At the same time, the theorists tell us that supersymmetry, if there, should show up the supersymmetric particles, the partners with different quantum mechanical spin of the known particles, should show up in this energy region. So this is the landmark energy range that we'd like to get to. How can we get there? The only way that we know to do it at the moment, from a technical point of view, is to build what's called a large hadron collider, a, collider, a, a large proton collider. And uh, this can be done at CERN, where, as John Maddox has said, we are proposing such a device which we can build on a constant budget, which remarkably has a level lower than it had 20 years ago. Particle physics is said to get more and more expensive. But in fact, in Europe, by reusing the existing facilities, we've kept the subject for over 20 years on a constant, even slightly decreasing budget. This project would open up a very large new domain where all sorts of things might be discovered. But in it, we're sure that we are going to discover something about whatever it is that hides the electroweak symmetry and therefore generates mass and tells us why some particles are massive, not just the W and Z particles, also the quarks and leptons, by the way, and why others are massless. And in this domain, we hope to find, expect even, according to the theorists, to find supersymmetry if it's there. CERN is, has an E in it. It's, suppo it's uh, supported by 19 European countries, but it's become a global organization. Today, half the world's par experimental particle physicists carry out their research at CERN. Uh, 
And there's been tremendous interest expressed worldwide in joining this, part, uh, this project in Japan, the United States, Canada, India, Russia, many other countries, in coming into this project as partners. If that were to happen, I think it would be uh, a wonderful thing. It would be a wonderful precedent to make a world project, uh, not just for particle physics, but for mega projects in other expensive areas of science. Let me sum up. The deep structure of matter does uh, possibly completely determine the structure of everything. And therefore, study of the deep structure of matter is, I believe, a major and must continue to be a major part of the scientific enterprise. The so-called standard model of quarks, leptons, strong electric weak, and gravitational forces is a very elegant synthesis of our present knowledge, but it cannot be the end. We know principles and ideas which could form the basis of a much deeper synthesis or understanding, but further progress will depend on experiment. Facilities that exist or are under construction already uh, provide exciting possibilities, but they do not cover the landmark region where something new must be found. The Large Hadron Collider at CERN is, and I quote here not my own words, I would be in favor of it, wouldn't I, as director of the lab, but these are the words of uh, the International Committee of Future Accelerate for Future Accelerators in a meeting where the directors of all the world's major labs in this field, from China, Japan, the United States, Canada, etc., were present, uh, passed a resolution that's saying that the LHC is the correct next step for particle physics at the high energy frontier. This particle will, this machine will discover the Higgs boson, or maybe not, then something else, whatever the missing ingredient is. If supersymmetry is there, it should find it. There's a big region for new phenomena. It will incidentally allow definitive uh, experiments on the asymmetry between matter and antimatter. And since the device can be used to accelerate heavy nuclei, it'll uh, enable us to study collisions of big nuclei at unprecedented energies and looking for the quark gluon plasma. In the somewhat longer term, it may also be possible to build a large electron-positron collider, which would explore the same region as the LHC, but in a complementary sort of fashion, with complementary devices which will be sensitive to slightly different things. Beyond that, uh, I will not speculate, as my time is up, I believe, and in any case, I think that the LHC will provide us plenty of marvelous science in the foreseeable future. Thank you. The, uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> he stalls. Um, I, I said, uh, I put here on the transparency, could there be unconventional quarks and leptons? The, the, the known uh, leptons seem to come in these pairs where one is heavy and one is either massless or very, very light. What we do now know from experiments at CERN is that there are no more light neutrinos. So we know that for these, if the pattern of leptons is one heavy, one very light, that's the end. There are no more than three, three sets of two, six. Then extrapolating from that, if it's not a coincidence, these numbers are the same, there will be no more pairs of quarks. 
So at least on the conventional pattern, uh, that's the end. But there could be unconventional ones. It's perfectly possible to imagine that there are uh, leptons with very heavy neutrinos, which could be discovered. So it may well be a wrong question. And if, when, when I've given an hour and not half an hour, I had first question is, is, are there six? And if so, what is that? Why? that space and time are continuous, as it's assumed in uh, most of these theories. Could it be that at a sufficiently small scale, there's a discreteness that might show up? Uh, yes, I think it could. I mean, I'm not an expert at all on quantum gravity, but that certainly seemed to me personally a possibility, yes. And we simply don't know, I mean, as uh, Joe Silk said, down to a certain scale, maybe the grand unified theory e scale even, we have certain confidence in the principles, if, if not that there really is a grand theory, unified theory or, or, or even the details. But once we get to the quantum gravity theory we level, we really don't know. Well, many, many thanks um, I should say that uh, we have a half hour break now for coffee. Um, I should say that before uh, we finish this session, uh, I think it, it is quite remarkable that all the theoretical <laughs> conclusions that Christopher Llewellyn Smith was talking about have been put together in the period between 1960 and now. Uh, it's a gigantic, he, call, he called it a Baroque uh, theory, but it's quite, quite extraordinary that so much should have been done in such a short time especially given the difficulty of getting the experimental data. For my part, I hope that the LS, uh, LHC will be both as quickly as possible and will then not have the shame of knowing that one important question is not being tackled for the time being. Many thanks indeed.